Hi everyone. This is Melanie Yazzie with Red Power Hour. We're back for a new episode. I'm joined as always by my co-host Elena. Want to say hi, Elena? Hello. This is Elena Ortiz calling in from Ogapoge, otherwise known as Santa Fe. Otherwise known as Mordor. <laughs> well, otherwise known as Mordor, that's right. <laughs> Uh, I'm calling in from uh, St. Paul, Minnesota Makoche, otherwise known as Settler Ranch Dressingville. It's a very vanilla, <laughs> yeah, good old Midwest. I'm not from here. Uh, cool. Thanks for <laughs> joining us again. Uh, we're going to do what I'm hoping is a fun episode today. Uh, we're going to do kind of like a indigenous left analysis of the planet of the apes movies um full disclosure this probably dates my generation because i'm a millennial but i've only seen the newer ones um so rise of the planet of the apes in 2011 dawn of planet of the apes came out in 2014 war for the planet of the apes in 2017 and then the most recent one that came out a few months ago kingdom kingdom of the planet of the apes um so that's what i'm going to be focusing on uh full disclosure i i love these movies well i don't really like the most recent one i think it's the oh. least uh effective it's the weakest one of the four but i have been wanting to talk about planet of the apes for years um back in the day when uh facebook was a thing um i think it was in 2014 when i watched dawn of planet of the apes i wrote this whole breakdown about like the commentary on settler colonialism that was in the movies probably unconscious i'm pretty sure the people writing the movie weren't weren't really aware that they were painting a very settler colonial picture um and it got a lot of interest actually uh on facebook at the time and so ever since then i've been wanting to talk about it so a decade later here we are we now have a podcast and we can do those things elena you we were just talking so you said your dad really loved the original ones with charlton heston yep my dad loved them and he he my father was an anthropologist so he always watched things with with a both a, a scholarly academic eye but also sort of in a in a in a very indigenous comedic way i remember him laughing hysterically about those first films and making disparaging remarks about charlton heston and about the human beings and saying something about finally they got it right um we've always known that animals were smarter than we are um so i think he he liked that those films for probably what what they started which was a different view of quote unquote evolution um but i'm not just referring to like evolution of darwinian evolution evolution of species but evolution of civilization and evolution of um, society and um, morality and all of that, you know, really heavy philosophical stuff. You can look at the old movies and think, oh my God, they're so bad. Um, they don't have the CGI. They don't have the, the um, screen capture, the green screens. You know, I'm, I'm actually Gen X, very cusp um, baby boomer. So I have both. And when you look at Caesar in these latest films, it, it is so lifelike. You actually don't even give a second thought to asking yourself, I wonder who's playing this character. Like it's just, that's who it is. So it's amazing. And that was different than the first ones. The first ones, when you look back on the first ones, it's kind of like looking at Star Trek versus Star Wars. Yeah. And of course there's Charlton Heston, which I, I can't even say. Although there yeah. are echoes of Charlton Heston, I think in the current series, because there's that sort of Moses, very patriarchal Christian theme around all of these movies. And it's no surprise, you know, that in the, in the latest one, the main ape character, the, the uh, antagonist is Proximus um, has a Roman name, which I always thought was weird, but yeah, there's a lot to talk about. 
Yeah, I so it's interesting that you bring up Charlton Heston because isn't Charlton wasn't Charlton Heston one of the main spokespeople for the NRA, the National oh, Rifle yeah. Association, for a really long time? Just like a really like a stalwart Republican, right? I think yep. I even remember this when I was a kid. Um, and so, as uh, we set out this year to defeat the divisive forces that would take freedom away. I want to say those fighting words for everyone within the sound of my voice to hear and to heed, and especially for you, Mr. Gore. <laughs> From my cold, dead hands. From my cold, dead hands. Listen, I was like, we should go chronologically, but I'm just going to dive in if that's okay. Because <laughs> I'm just thinking about something that happened this week, which is the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And uh, speaking of Republicans, and so the there were several police forces that were brought into Milwaukee to police the perimeter around um, the convention. I think police presence was probably heightened after the so-called assassination attempt on Trump last weekend. There were a handful of Ohio police, police from Ohio State Police, I believe, who were on bikes in a neighborhood. Um, I'm not sure what the neighborhood was in Milwaukee, but they shot and killed a black man, Samuel Sharp, uh, who was actually defending himself against someone who was attacking him. Um, he had like sharp objects or whatever, but he was just defending himself. I guess he lived on the street and uh, the community had actually given him the paring knives to defend himself because um, this other person who he was fighting at the time, I guess, was threatening to kill him and his dog. And Samuel was like apparently beloved by his community. Apparently he was well known on the streets for like protecting women um, and protecting other folks. He was just a really good relative. And um, even the local Milwaukee police knew him. And so I watched the body cam footage from these Ohio State police. They were very far away. Uh, they were actually in a place they weren't supposed to be because they were supposed to be policing a certain zone of the one mile, I think it was a mile perimeter or whatever, um, around uh, the RNC. And they witnessed, you know, in passing um, Samuel fighting with this other individual who was trying to hurt him. And they, you can see on their body cam, they start yelling at Samuel, put the weapon down, put the weapon down. I mean, they draw their guns immediately. This was like five or six cops. And they immediately start moving towards him. He has his back turned and he's because he's fighting. He's like literally defending himself against this other guy. Um, and they're still very far away. They give him the command about two or three times to put the weapon down. There's no indication that he even hears them. And then like, I think it was like five cops just open fire on him. And there were dozens of bullet holes um, riddling the buildings behind I, I actually don't, he was shot several times and later found out because they believe there was like a press conference and a vigil later on this past, like a couple of days ago that his family held, but um, there were many bystanders uh, actually who were very close by when this all happened. And they said, you couldn't even hear the cops. Like you, no one knew they were there and no one could hear them. Samuel didn't even know these cops were giving him a command and he had his back turned to them because he was defending himself. So the reason why I'm telling this story is because I was thinking a lot, you know, I think a lot about the fact that um, I'm pretty certain that Trump is going to win the election in November. And I think his chances were increased, like a lot of people are saying online, uh, because he quote unquote survived an assassination attempt. I'm chuckling because like, I don't know, I who cares? Who cares if Trump dies? <laughs> but uh uh, nothing, nothing will change. Nothing will change. Um, I think the shit show will still continue. And I think we're just descending into fascism, regardless of who actually takes office, whether it's Biden or Trump or, you know, someone else in the Republican Party. I've been just thinking a lot about what the next, the four years after Trump is elected, what that's going to feel like. And just thinking a lot about fascism. And I made this comment. Um, one of our comrades was actually on the ground at the RNC doing tactical media for various things. And we were having a conversation two nights ago and I made this passing comment and he noted it. And I was like, 
you well like speaking of San, the the murder um the police murdering samuel um sharp i was like well you can't really have a large gathering of fash like that without someone getting gunned down because that's what the fash is known for i think we talked a lot about it a lot on this podcast and this isn't to make light of the fact um that samuel uh sharp was murdered but I, the point that I was trying to make is that the Republican Party and the banner of fascism that it now just proudly brandishes, um, I think especially in the Trump era of the Republican Party, it really has that hyper-militarized, um, hyper-violent personality and a character to it. Um, I think the, the glorification of the Second Amendment um, that Charlton Heston uh, so often uh, promoted on behalf of the Republican Party in his day uh, really represents that because um, you hear that all the time um, in right wing rhetoric. And that reminded me, it's like the that 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 aspect of fascism that's hyper militarized and hyper violent is like a, a fortification. Right. And I think a lot about the things we've written about border town violence and how settler vigilantes and reservation border towns are extremely violent, like they engage in Indian killing and Indian rolling, because like that's how their masculinity comes into existence. Like young white and his well, in, in New Mexico Hispanic men come to, come to age through like violence against Native people, through killing Native people, through maiming them. Um, and we all know also in the United States that like white settler masculinity also comes into existence um, and is kind of refortified through like the murdering and the violence against black folks as well, particularly men, black men and indigenous men. And so that, that reminded me of the Woody Harrelson character in War for Planet of the Apes, um, who just seems really bloodthirsty. That's the thing. I was like, the RNC is literally filled right now with a bunch of people, like fascists really love blood sport. They love blood sport. Like people who Indian roll um, in reservation border towns, that is a blood sport for them. And so that Woody Harrelson character and like you see Woody, the Woody Harrelson character, I forgot his name in War for Planet of the Apes. Also just a really, uh, what's the word, sadistic character, enjoys torturing people. Like you said, Elena, there's no women. There's definitely no like lgbtq <laughs> to people um and like the last vestiges of the human population um in the the latter the latter movies and so you all you see is like the logical conclusion in my mind of like where we're at right now with um the descent into fascism and the crumbling of u.s empire and the little crumbling of like the human empire in Planet of the Apes. And then, you know, you fast forward to 2024 to the movie that just came out and, you know, like the cities are all kind of crumbling and being taken back by the land. But I was just thinking like, I felt like Kingdom of Planet of the Apes was like fast forwarding from where we are at right now. And that the fall of the human empire very much feels parallel to the fall of US empire. And like the humans who survive are military people. They're just fascists. The humans who survive are the fash. <laughs> I guess that's what I'm saying. It's just men, it's hyper violent men who engage in blood sport. And like that is, that's their kinship. And like, that's their ontology. Even when you fast forward to kingdom, well, not so much kingdom of planet of the apes, definitely war for planet of the apes. And so, yeah, that was just something I was thinking a lot about in terms of like reading the the present moment, like the, the big news story or whatever of the week back through the lens of Planet of the Apes. Yeah, the, the, definitely. And and so Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes to me is the weakest and but war for the, so, so I'm looking, yeah, Woody Harrelson absolutely goes full on Heart of Darkness, full on um, Apocalypse Now. And, you know, he's basically Mar the new Marlon Brando in you know with the shaved head and the glasses and and all that and even though apocalypse now was taken from a book um which was not set during the vietnam war 
Apocalypse Now was set during the Vietnam War. And the first series of Planet of the Apes movies also came out at the height of the Vietnam War. So this this was a, a you know, this was a nation that was struggling with this nascent civil rights and LGBTQ and, um, you know, Black Panthers and American Indian movement, Brown Power, the Brown Berets, you know, and you had filmmakers coming out with this series of movies, the first Planet of the Apes with literally the guy who plays Moses as the human protagonist. And then, you know, you skip ahead everything that's happened in, you know, in this country. Yes, the crumbling of not only imperialism, the fall of the United States, the fall of empire. And, and you start to see this with the rise of the Planet of the Apes. And then I think they got it right with War of the Planet of the Apes. I think that was probably the best one. And there's that scene in the end when, so Woody Harrelson, who I think is, I'm not sure I ever heard a name. Was he just the general or anyway? Yeah, maybe it was just the general. Maybe yeah. it was that. And he's, Caesar goes up to kill him and he's there and the virus has rendered him unable to speak. So he's got the virus and he's going to become in his words, you know, nothing better than an animal. So Caesar gives him his gun and he kills himself and Caesar's trying to get out of there. And one of the, the apes who had been um, working for the humans um, helps him escape and he's running and he's running and Maurice and the, the good apes have scattered for the hills. They've gotten the women and children out of there and they've headed for the hills. They've headed for the trees and there's an avalanche and you see, you see Caesar barely make it up a tree and, and on the ground, all of the humans. So there's the, bad humans that were led by this general, Woody Harrelson. And then the good humans are supposed to be coming in to, to like save the world from this, this fascist dictator military. They look like stormtroopers. The yeah, quote unquote good like humans. And, and they're, they're there and they're literally just killing each other. Like just mass slaughter outside and inside of this, what used to be a hospital and the apes um, are all up the, the tree because they hear this avalanche coming down and, and Caesar turns and looks. And this is where I think the, the CGI or the, the motion capture, whatever it is, the filmmaking magic, um, you see his face and he's looking at these humans and he's just watching them kill each other. And that's all they're doing. Like there's no point in what they're doing. It's just, it's just mass murder. And then they all get swallowed up by an avalanche and the apes all head off. Like it's, I mean, I think that's the, the humans are, are all of the imperial fascist settler, colonial powers out there, massacring each other and the apes are all of the rest of us just trying to survive man you just so i've watched these movies multiple times over the last the first one came out in 2011 so what 13 years and what you just said kind of blew my mind because you're right in because caesar dies right at the end of war spoiler alert i guess for people who haven't seen these movies but that movie came out in 2017 so you're a little behind but caesar dies at the end of war uh, for planet of the apes and so do you think that in that like gesture of turning around and looking at the stormtrooper humans from the north and then like the woody harrelson fash apocalypse now humans 
who are like barricaded and fortified in this former hospital. Do you think Caesar in that moment is just like, you know what? Kobo was right. Like yep. I was wrong. Ape and human cannot live together because yep. humans are this, this right here. This is what the human empire represents. Yep. Just unadulterated violence. Yeah. I absolutely believe that. And I believe like that was what I wrote down when I watched, I had seen these all before, but it was when they came out. So I watched them all this week, one after the other. And I have notes down and next to war of the planet of the apes. The only thing I wrote down was Koba was right. And then, you know, and then some notes on Woody Harrelson and, and apocalypse now, but I think that's Caesar. I think, that was the the overarching message of that film is that human beings are incapable of living peacefully that they will and i think you know human beings in these films it, it refers to sp a specific it reads as americans or it reads as nazis fash the Israeli government, you know, that's who it reads as. It does not read as indigenous people. Um, indigenous people um, are the apes. But the humans as depicted in these films are incapable of living on this earth and destroy everything that they touch, that they see. And I think that's Caesar's final realization. And then they end up in this beautiful one, wherever they ended up in that, in that film, it kind of, it was like up in the mountains with this beautiful lake and they're having this celebration that they're free and uh, like all the humans that they've dealt with in the entire movie are dead. So um, probably no one's coming after them. <laughs> It looks like maybe like Yosemite or Tahoe kind of. Yeah, I was thinking Tahoe you know? when I first saw it, but yeah. Where they end up. Oh my God, I have so much to say. <laughs> what you just shared. Uh, I don't know where to start. So the commentary on indigeneity, I think is really interesting. I feel like once you get to kingdom, so you're totally right. All of the quote unquote human beings, they're just like Americans. Most, almost all of, almost all. No, all of them are just like white settlers, white settler Americans, all of them in the entire four film series. And so it's definitely about U.S. empire. It's not it's not about human. I mean, the film is pro, uh, projecting it as if it's about like human versus ape. But we only understand what's happening within the context of like the U.S. and then the former United States. And so even at the very end of Kingdom of Planet of the Apes, the um, main human protagonist, May, she has been able to retrieve something that she needs um, and she takes it to another, presumably, it looks like a military base. I don't know where, she's like on the plane somewhere. I don't really understand how she went that far on a horse. Um, but, and then she gives it to them and then they put it into the machine or whatever. And then the satellites all trigger and then they're able to like talk. And like the very last thing you see is a conversation between the military base in the planes where she took the device and then a military base, I think in Fort Wayne, Indiana, which is another military outpost. And so it's all still just in what used to be the United States. So I feel like it's a very thinly coded, like it's, it's there, the movie is projecting it like human empire, but I really think it's about us empire specifically. And so the reason why I'm saying this is I feel like the, the character of May, um, right? It's been like several generations since Caesar has died between Warrior for Planet of the Apes and Kingdom of Planet of the Apes. And you see like there's this one scene where uh, there are other humans who are also white people, but I don't really understand why the only humans who lived are white. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they're all like dreaded out and they just, uh, they kind of are acting like animals because right. One of the premises of the movie is that it's reverse evolution or whatever, like human beings lose the ability to speak or to like think from what I can tell to reason. Um, so they become like preliterate essentially. 
And so then like the bad, the bad apes of the movie, the Proximus is a uh, crew that goes around and pillages different tribes, ape tribes um, and clans, and then tries to bring them in under his budding empire, what he calls a kingdom. Anyway, we can talk more about ape empire later, but the, the only humans that are left are these, like, basically they're savages, right? They're pre, they're not human. They're subhuman at this point. They're not quite animals, but they're also not human. And those people used to be like white Americans, presumably, or their ancestors were. And so I feel like the movie is trying to make us feel like, oh, like those people are now the indigenous people. Like the humans are the indigenous people now and the apes are the new imperialists because Proximus is, he's trying to create a kingdom. From what I can tell, he's trying to create an empire of some kind, but that is like, if that is what was going on in the, the minds of like these white writers <laughs> writing this movie, it's really, there's obviously a huge fallacy that's incredibly racist. Under, if we're being led to believe that like May is kind of like the last of the Mohicans essentially, right? This is like the vanishing race. The human race is the vanishing race. May is like the last of her kind or like maybe one of the last of her kind. And she's like trying to save, you know, her people. And all of the rest of her people have like, of her race has slipped into savagery. And she is trying to rebuild, you know, with the very, the, the very few people, the very few humans who are left, the very few Americans who are left. She's trying to rebuild like American civilization. It's not just like a reverse of evolution. I actually don't even think the movie's about evolution. I think it's really much more about the interplay between like civilization and savagery. That's always been at the center of like American uh, notions of liberalism, going all the way back to like John Locke, you know, thinking about classical liberal thought. But I feel like Kingdom of Planet of the Apes is trying to get us to think about the humans as indigenous and the apes as like the new imperialists. And that's not cool to me at all. Because those humans, like, first of all, they caused their own downfall. It was the technology that they developed that created the virus that killed all of them. And they horribly oppressed all other life forms <laughs> on the planet, including apes. And so that is not the same story as like indigenous people, indigenous people, right? Like indigenous people also died from like mass disease. And we have also like survived an apocalypse. Do you get what I'm saying? And so I feel like there's this weird, maybe they're trying to get us to think that these like white former Americans <laughs> are indigenous, but I'm not falling for it. And you just said yeah. like the apes are everybody else besides kind of like the, the white settler imperialist fash, right? And yeah. I still think that that is the truth even once we enter into the period that where kingdom of planet of the apes is transpiring like one of the things that struck me like absolutely i mean i, I absolutely agree with everything you just said and so i thought may retrieved like this little motherboard from that place in kingdom and the the giant um whatever it was vault and then she rode really really far because she was on the coast i thought she ended up at cheyenne mountain which is like the headquarters for nora yeah. oh, okay it, yeah in Colorado. she puts it, it she goes underground i mean it didn't look like cheyenne mountain because it would have been surrounded by mountains but whatever she puts it in and all of a sudden um, the radio telescopes start moving, even though they're skeletal um, and they're able to. Yes. Yeah, so what she's doing is she's taking, I thought what she was doing was taking something from one military installation to another military installation, because of course the military is the only thing that can save us. And that, that just, you know, goes right into this, this militarism um, that this movie is all about. Um, but then what's, what, what the other thing that was really sort of stark to me is particularly in, in war, um, for the planet of the apes or war of the planet of the apes, like 
you see the the children like you see caesar's children and you see the other children in that place where they were living um and and even when they took them to this, this to the prison there was a place where the kids were and there was a place where the women the female um apes were but in no none of the human areas do you see any women so when when um woody harrelson's character when the general um is there with his full-on fash like if they win against the stormtroopers that are coming how are they going to live how are they going to procreate they, like it's all men there's no women so there's no it's like they represent the the ultimate patriarchy which is like reproduction through enslavement and that they have no no way of creating a society they have no way of creating the next generation but they will enslave the apes and um have them basically be their be their workers damn what you just said that it is against so many things the ultimate patriarchy it's reproduction through enslavement and I would add just like violence and yeah. that right there, that is America. That yeah. is America. It isn't, this is, in, this is make increasingly convinced, con, increasingly convincing me that my, my inkling that the word evolution, even though that is used, even Proximus taught, has a conversation with the humans around the table in Kingdom of Planet of the Apes about evolution. He calls it evolution. It's like, I love the way he says it. Anyway, it's not actually about evolution. It's just about manifest destiny because that's the movie is not about evolution, whether it's like apes evolving into what humans used to be and humans reverse devolving into what quote unquote apes used to be. The movie, it, the movies and the story is just about like, the interplay between savagery and civilization, which has always been at the heart of Manifest Destiny. Because once you get to war for Planet of the Apes, and even May, like what you were just saying, you know, she's taking something from one military outpost to another military outpost. The very last thing she says when she goes um, to the, the, the village for Noah, Noah's the main character, then a main ape character in Kingdom yeah. from Planet of the Apes. And they're indigenous. Like Noah and his village are clearly indigenous. They have like elders, they, they're they eagle keepers and they yeah. even call themselves a clan. They're the yep. eagle clan. And so they are coded very clearly as indigenous as are, I would presume the other tribes and the clans that have also been enslaved by Proximus in the war, right? When he's trying to build his kingdom and his empire. And so May comes after, you know, all the things that happen where they bring down Proximus or whatever may comes to visit noah to say goodbye like under the pretense of saying goodbye before she heads off to the military installation to screw over all of the apes and noah actually i wrote this down he said proximus was right humans will not give up until you claim all things for yourselves and then may very she, she's she pauses and she said it was all ours and i was like and then she has a gun behind her back because he also poses the question, you know, was Rocco correct? Because Rocco's the orangutan, isn't part of the order of Caesar that still exists by the time Kingdom of Planet of the Apes comes around. And, you know, the presumption, right, is that they all still think that Caesar, probably even up to his death, believed that like ape and human could live together, even though I think you're right. I think at the very end, he's just like, nah, dog. <laughs> like, ape and human cannot live together. Humans are insane. Um, and so as he's saying, can ape and human live together? Noah is saying this to May, the camera pans behind her back and she has a gun. So she's like, in, throughout the entire movie, the entire movie of Kingdom of Planet of the Apes, she just lies and she just uses Noah and the other apes to get what she wants. Cause she wants US imperialism to come back. She That's what she wants. And so even, even you're fast forwarding multiple generations, there are very few humans left, i.e. there are very few Americans left, white Americans. And even then, you cannot pry that like settler manifest destiny ontology out of 
out of their minds. You would have to pry it out of their cold, dead fingers. Like that is how, and that is why the fash are supposed, like in the mind of Planet of the Apes and probably in the minds of lots of fash, that's why they're the last ones to survive an apocalypse. That's why like hyper-militarism, what did you say earlier? The military is the only thing that can save us. And we're literally being told that right now. Like yeah. the U.S. has completely lost hegemony throughout the world. Its whole like path towards world dominance after World War II has failed economically and it has also failed in terms of production. And so right now the U.S., what the one thing that it does have a monopoly on is militarism and military violence as the way to secure its like imperial domination throughout the world, both externally, but also internally against um, internally colonized populations like native folks and black folks. And so it's the literally like what we're seeing, the U S is a crumbling empire. And you also are just seeing right now that the military is the only thing that can save us. This is also what we're seeing so clearly in Israel. The, the military is the only thing that can save whatever, whatever they think of as, as the integrity of their settler souls, you know, on stolen Palestinian land. And so I, this is just like, I'm getting very Yoda just thinking about it. No, and May, May when you when you start talking about May, when she said that, I, I forgot about that quote. She also completely that that completely codes as Israeli. Like I could hear that same phrase coming out of Netanyahu's mouth when when um, he says when Noah says apes and humans, you know, can never get along because because um, you you want everything. What did, what was the quote again? Proximus was right. Humans will not give up until you claim all things for yourselves. And she says that's because it it was all ours yep. to begin with, which yep. is that is that is, that is like the, the basis for, you know, all of the bogus Israeli claims um, uh, of Palestinian land. It was all ours to begin with because it's in the freaking Bible because God said so. And that, that, that was the one thing I remember that, that struck me is that absolutely is the epitome of imperialism and, and colonialism in Israel and in the United States. I mean, in Israel, it was a land without a people for a people without a land. Just forget about the fact that there were actually people on that land. And then in the United States Manifest Destiny, but also, you know, there's all this land and they're not using it. Why can't we have it? And that's exactly what what they're saying in in that film is is, uh, um, you know, the humans in the end want to reclaim everything because it was all theirs to begin with. And the virus that changed all that, they're not even acknowledging that it was their creation but they have to destroy the apes because the apes are threatening their em- empire, the rebuilding of their military empire. And it's wild. Cause it's like, you all lost, like you fucking lost. <laughs> You're you lost. And even then, and this really is the tale. I swear to God, this is the tale of settler identity. Even then settlers are like, no, this is still ours in our minds, even like multiple generations later. And there's like, not even, they don't even have power. They don't have any power left. And they're like, no, we are going to still claim this because that claiming that claim of ownership, which like what may says, you know, like it was all ours to begin with that bullshit, like manifest destiny, that settlerness that, that even persists all the way up until the very end. And so that whole liberal bullshit narrative that underwrites everything in the United States of like, let's say white settler America has civilization, right? And then indigenous people are savages who couldn't take care, they couldn't take care of the land. So the land needed to be taken from them. Or the fact that like black Africans were savages as well. And therefore that was the rationale for enslaving them and stealing them from their continent. This is what America tells itself. And this is what liberalism tells itself that like, we're the civilized people 
And I think what's interesting about Planet of the Apes is that the humans, i.e. The, the white Americans, they have no civilization anymore. Their civilization actually brought about their demise and they're no longer civilized because they can't even speak or read or think really for the most part. But really deep down, laid bare, they never even had civilization because what America thinks of or what Israel might think of as civilization is just pure violence. That's all it is. Well, what you just said, it's the ultimate it's, patriarchy. It's a re, it's social reproduction happens through enslavement. It just happens through violence. Social yeah. reproduction happens through violence. And that is liberalism. Liberalism is a theory of social reproduction through violence. It's not about civilization. It's not about democracy. It's not about universal rights. It's not about any of that bullshit. And that's what settler colonialism tells us about liberalism. And so anyway, this movie made me very yoded thinking about those things. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and it's, it's interesting that at the end of um, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, was it Dawn or no R war for the planet of the apes Caesar comes to the conclusion. I think, I think he comes to the conclusion that Koba was right. And Koba was so destroyed by imperialism, settler colonial colonialism, um, the genocide that was enacted on, um, he and his and his relatives he understood the only way forward was for them to die so coding that into imperialism colonialism must die and capitalism must die and then you go through kingdom of the, kingdom of the planet of the apes and noah comes to the same conclusion um when he he says Proximus was right. Like there is this theme throughout all of the movies that, that human beings must, human beings coding as imperialism and, and um, colonialism must be destroyed. And, and yet you still have the human beings starting up the military presence again with being in touch with with other and you can you can only imagine you know the human beings that survived their end goal isn't to like develop agriculture or figure out you know ways to live on the earth like the apes have um and become a more tribal people, a more communal, relational people. Like, what is Caesar's number one rule? Ape, not kill ape. And humans, on the other hand, are heading straight for militarism. Like, the very thing that destroyed them is what they're trying to recreate. And there's never any, like, there's never any mention of agriculture or or fishing, or how do they get their food? But boy, they got guns and bombs. Well, yeah, because if the human race in Planet of the Apes is really just Americans, let's say like white Americans, I mean, the reason why they can't make their own food is because capitalism requires like an entire like proletariat and lumpen proletariat to produce and to grow that food for you. All you do is consume it. You don't have any real labor skills to be able to do all of the things that are required to live life, right? That's what like all of the service economy is built on. And I mean, what is the statistic that the US is a small percentage of the world's population, but consumes how much per, like a, a significant amount of the world's energy and like, and, and then emits a significant amount of the world's carbon like that right there should just tell you. Right. And, and the humans aren't even, and that's why like the humans, even the ones who become like preliterate who have the dreadlocks and stuff by kingdom of planet of the apes, they can't, they don't even seem to be like, they're not clean. 
they're not clean. They seem like scavengers. Like they don't even seem capable of feeding themselves or like basic hygiene. And so, yeah, it's just so, even May kind of looks like a cave woman for most of the movie, even after she outs herself as like an intelligent human. I'm like, girl, like brush your hair and wash your face. Like, well, I don't- and the, and the guy, when she gets there and they release her and she's taken by that other human and, and he's the one who's, who's working with the apes to try to, to open the gates of that giant vault. And he says, here, take a shower. No, there's a, in the back room, take a bath and there's some clean clothes. And the next thing you see her, she still looks dirty and she's still wearing ragged clothes. And it's like, I, I had that, that same, I, I noticed that. I was like, so did you ba- take a bath or not? Because you still look dirty. Your face is dirty. Your clothes are dirty. The apes, on the other hand, all look clean. Like, yeah, very clean. You know, they, they do even um, bad ape who is living by himself and he's a little bit, you know, um, brain addled um, from being alone. Even he looks clean and he can move and, you know, he has clothes and a jacket and shoes, but the humans just look like, I don't even know. Yeah. And there's no, no, totally. And like, there's no indication through any of the movies, well, particularly Dawn of Planet of the Apes, their kingdom for plant, King, Kingdom of Planet of the Apes, that the humans just want to survive. They're just like, okay, so we're dwindling. We have these really small enclaves now. So we're just going to create our own villages and we're gonna like coexist with the apes. And we're gonna learn how to make our own food, We're going to be able to like live in our own communities from this point forward like this, because obviously they're still quote unquote intelligent humans um, during the time and the period of kingdom of planet of the apes. And no, no, either they just turn like full caveman and like full savage, or they're just like hyper militarism or like hyper violent. There's only two things apparently in the mind of like the American pop culture imagination. You can only be a savage or you can, just be like a soldier. And those are the only two things. And that right there, the savage and the soldier, that's literally the basis of the thin blue line. Like that is the basis of US imperialism. That's like the Geronimo figure is the savage. We talked about this last time. And the soldier is the person like who upholds settler order and like the sanctity of like settler and imperial, uh, the sanctity of US, US nationalism and identity. And that is the literal basis for like how imperialism unfolds and reproduces over and over and over again. I It's so fascinating you said, I wanted to come back to this. I didn't even realize this, even though it makes sense given the years that they came out, that the original Planet of the Apes, it was a trilogy, right? Or was it four yeah. also at that time? Um, I think it was came out, I think it was three. Three, uh, yeah. came out during the Vietnam War. Right there is a, is a, ver- is a perfect, like a storm of US imperialism that actually people just a couple of months ago when the student um, encampments, divestment encampments were, you know, taking the world by by firestorm um, on, in, on, at universities and colleges, people were comparing that to the anti-war movement against Vietnam, you know, up 50 years ago. And why did the US enter Vietnam? It was to crush communism right? Because communism was seen, communism and socialism was seen as the number one enemy of US imperial dominance throughout the world, because it was providing an alternative to capitalism. And so that's why the US entered, you know, Vietnam, they wanted to crush Vietnamese communism. And though that the that that type of communism at that time, like, what was then known as the third world and national liberation struggles, even today in the global South, even though the iterations of those national liberation struggles have changed um, over the last 50 years, they still represent a real alternative, I guess, to like US settler empire. And so what's what's so interesting about the way that the humans slash white Americans in Planet of the Apes act is that they don't know how to even just survive they can't even just take care of themselves. They 
have to be an empire, period. Like the only way they know is either to go full savage or like full empire. There's like nothing in between. And I'm telling you that right there, that's America. Yeah. Because that really literally is the internal engine of U.S. imperialism. And then I think in the last two movies, like there's no structure in the humans other than hierarch- hierarchical fascism, other than just this militarized um, killing machine. Whereas with the apes, you see friendships. You see, even with May, they take her and they take care of her. You know, they adopt her, they feed her, they make sure that she's got a jacket, whatever. And with the humans, there's 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 almost no, and it's funny to use this word, but there's almost no humanity in the humans. The only humanity comes from the apes. And the the way they interact with one another and taking bad ape, you know, with them because because he knows the way to um, the military base, but also um, just to take care of him because he's by himself and they're social people. And the relationship between Maurice and, and Caesar, you know, there's relationships between the apes that you don't see with the humans. You, humans are all, I guess there was, the, there was the one couple in that. Oh yeah, the dawn of Planet of dawn. the Apes. When they're yeah, trying to build that, the dam, right? Or open the yeah, dam up trying, for energy. Yeah. But that's the last time you see it. And in, in 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 war and kingdom, there's like no there's no relationships. Damn, that's true. There's no relationships. It's just like herds of human, quote unquote, like savage types and then hyper militarization. But you can else I mean May may does not hesitate to kill the other dude the only other human who's at that at proximus's you know city or whatever yeah she does not hesitate to kill him and so that also would indicate a complete absence of relationality right and you're you're right like the whether it's the caesar version even the coba version of what ape survival and ape community looks like it is deeply relational and proximus proximus is let me backtrack so it's right so the premise like the movie starts the 2011 movie the rise of planet of the apes um yes the human beings um create i.e white americans (laughs) create technology that is ultimately their demise and then also creates the rise of of apes but the apes are imprisoned and like yeah. the story of planet of the apes is a story of their liberation right like caesar literally liberates his peeps from prison and he's not trying to kill all humans he just wants to be free and even Koba, i think wants to be free but they have very different understandings of how to go about that because at that time caesar thought we can still coexist with humans right we can still be free and koba's koba immediately is just like nah dog like you can't you got to kill him like that ain't gonna happen and i just want to let folks know i know i'm rambling but in the red nation pretty much everyone in the red nation is in the koba was right camp (laughs) just to let you know not yeah. Not to say that like Caesar was trying to be a real leader, right? He said, ape does not kill ape. He didn't want apes to suffer because he just wanted them to be free. And I feel like what you see across all four movies, the humans I eat, slash white Americans are just very black and white, right? They're either this or that. There's no, there's no alternative for them. And this is true, I would say, in general of the U.S., Obviously, the way that Israel has behaved since last October demonstrates that there is no alternative for settler colonialism other than to dominate through violence, period. 
Like it is not interested in coexisting. Like that's not its internal, that's not how it functions. Um, it destroys in order to replace. And if it can't do that, then it will cease. You will have to uh, kill it, <laughs> you know? Like colonialism must die. That's why we say that in the Red Deal. But for the apes, I feel like they represent indigenous people for sure. But I feel like indigenous people are part of like the global South, I would say. Um, people don't think about indigenous folks who um, are like subjects of like internal, quote unquote, internal subjects, even though I have problems with that framing of the United States as members of like the, the darker nations, as they call them, or the global South. But I think we do because we're colonized nations who also seek and, and desire liberation from you know, the, the yoke of US colonialism and imperialism. We were, after all, the very first anti-imperialists, you know, trying to fight um, against the US from taking our lands and conquering our nations. So I feel like the apes represent the global South and the movements for national liberation or just movements for liberation and freedom from the oppression of colonialism, imperialism, and capitalism, like those movements and those struggles look really differently in different places. And there's like profound disagreement about how to go about like the strategy and the tactic for liberation and revolution. And I think Caesar and Koba represent two versions of that, that I see a lot in the movement and have seen historically. Um, I think Proximus represents, I don't know, kind of like those assembly of first nations people who just recently um, revoked their support for clemency <laughs> for Leonard Peltier, you know, <laughs> it just, it's, yeah. Proximus is because he says he wants to get into the vault to gain access to the human technology to accelerate evolution and presumably to just gain more power for himself. And that kind of cronyism, I guess, is something that you see a lot in, let's say, like newly independent um, nations that have been able to liberate themselves from the yoke of like British colonialism, for example. And so there are the way that the apes act and the various kinds of relationalities that they have seem to me to represent like the spectrum of what the continued struggle, the continued revolutionary struggle for liberation looks like, I guess, in a lot of contexts in the global South. And it's not so simple as to say someone's a sellout versus someone's like a true radical or those kinds of things. And I feel like you see that with the apes. And Planet of the Apes, all four movies. Yeah, I like that read. I I definitely believe in all of the movies that that the apes represent indigenous people, mm-hmm. black people. I mean, the, the first scene in the first movie really disturbed me because I think when I saw it way back when it came out, I wasn't paying attention or I didn't notice. But that very first scene on that in, in Rise, when when you see the apes running through the jungle and they're being shot at and they're, they're being captured in these traps that go up in the trees and the, um, and um, pits that are dug. It's just a scene that looks like slavers capturing um, black slaves from Africa. And then you see that the people capturing them are are black people and that these apes, chimpanzees are going to be imprisoned and experimented on in this hospital. So there's also a kind of um, weaving together of both um, African enslavement, diaspora, um, because they all end up of course in the United States, but What's what's amazing is that, you know, indigenous people have strong ties to the land and have always survived by being in, in, in relation to the place that we came from. But the sort of generic indigeneity ascribed to these apes in these films is they could pretty much survive everywhere because they're indigenous or because they're native or because, um, because they're apes. Um, they are, I think, um, they're in the mountains. 
did, I mean, when, when Caesar first escaped, they were up in the Muir woods. And my first thought as they were up in the, in the woods during um, dawn of the planet of the apes is, I wonder what they're eating. Like, what is there up in the Muir woods that, that apes can eat? But because they're indigenous, they've figured it out. They formed relations with the land and with the Eagle clan, with Noah's Eagle clan um, in, in uh, the last movie, you see they have gone full on sort of North American indigenous, but, but it doesn't matter because what they represent is ind indigeneity itself. And it's not um, place centric. It, I mean, yes, we're talking about, right. I think, the United States. We're talking about the fall of the of the American Empire. But but I think with the apes, they represent ind indigeneity in total, no matter where they are. Right. And so, like, they were formally enslaved, right? And, you know, the enslaved Africans aren't. They, they were indigenous people who were stolen from their yep. land. And so what you see, I like where you're going with that the apes are, you're right, they're, they're coded as indigenous, but like in the sense of like previously unfree, like enslaved or colonized. And now they have been decolonized and liberated. And yeah. what you see by the time kingdom comes around is they're experimenting with the different types of social socialization and like what what the world could look like. And so you're right, the community Noah comes from seems very coded as like a North American indigenous kind of tribe or clan or small community. Uh, what Proximus is doing seems to be he's like kind of trying to replicate what humans did. That's kind of what Proximus's character reminded me of. He's like... <laughs> He's like the post-colonial uh, person um, who's trying to be the colonizer in a way or trying to like uh, mimic like the colonizer. Uh, Fanon talked about this obviously a lot in uh, Wretched of the Earth. And so I feel like there's like a commentary on like that figure. I, again, I think a lot of tribal leaders, I think of a lot of tribal leaders like this as well, but we're not in a post-colonial state. We're still colonized. But anyway... I like how you're thinking about how it's about indigeneity, but like the broader category. Um, it's not just us, like indigenous people, the indigenous people of today. Yeah. And then I find it interesting too, that, um, that Proximus, he wants to learn about Roman civilization and he chooses a name from Roman civilization because Caesar, who was named by the guy in the first movie when he was a baby chimp because his name has resonated through the generations. So for some reason, you know, Proximus decides that it's Roman civilization that he needs to replicate. And it's very ironic because I think of, of the rise and fall of, of Rome, of the Roman civilization, I think, in a lot of ways, it's a parallel to what's happening in this country now, which is, you know, this this all encompassing empire that literally ate itself from within, disintegrated, and that's exactly what what this country is doing right now, and and so it's it's interesting that they chose Rome out of anything they could have chosen, they chose Rome to emulate and to use as a as a ideal civilization to um to use when it's literally what's happening right now this reminds me there's this uh yes okay sorry i was looking up something on my phone so yeah like proximus takes <laughs> he takes the caesar thing a little bit too literally um but what's so fascinating about that obsession with the Roman empire is I was made aware cause I'm not on social media that there is a, uh, so there's this Roman empire meme that's become really uh, popular, especially last year into the early part of this year on TikTok, And it's a uh, people who are really obsessed with the Roman empire. And there is like, like some of the most popular movies of all time in the U S like gladiator 
you know, are about the Roman Empire. There's even a new like gladiator show on HBO or something or Prime, or, I don't know, coming out. But Americans, I think especially men, really love that shit. There's like this nostalgia for the Roman Empire. And again, I think it's just about imperialism and like violence and heroism, you know, and just about like when men used to be men, <laughs> you know, they they fought for their glory and their lives. And anyway, uh, it's just really funny that Proximus is just like a dude. <laughs> he's like a he's like a dumb dude. That's what he reminds me of. <laughs> Yeah, be apes. And trust me, just because like, we may all be, you know, post colonial, or we may have like been able to liberate ourselves doesn't mean we can like cast off like the shackles, especially like the the internal the internalized colonialism, you know, that many of us uh, would probably still struggle with even after we achieve, let's say, like formal national liberation. This is something Fanon also talked about a lot. Yeah, in his work. Inter what have we internalized that we will carry with us into the next generation if we do achieve, you know, full liberation? Um, because this is generations and generations of being structured and, and surrounded by these thoughts and ideas and um, liberation can only happen if we liberate our minds and that's the hardest thing to do because we have been surrounded by this idea that capitalism is, is good. Communism is bad. The United States was founded on the principles of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Or was that Superman? I don't know. Um, they're the same. And, and this lie, the great lie of the founding of this country and the great, it's, it's this, it, it, it's the exact same thing as Israel the great lies that founded these colonial projects and the subsequent lies that were told every step of the way and are codified in books and documents and our judicial system and every the all of the, the legislative um, bullshit and to extricate oneself from all of that um, and I hope I, I see the beginnings of this. I hope the empire crumbles. I mean, I'd like it to crumble right now. I'm ready for it to crumble right now. And I wish that, you know, um, the giant orange turd had died. And I wish that, that um, you know, we, we could move forward in a world where we value the earth and we value our relationships with um, other than, than human beings and with our communities and and extricating oneself from all of that is is going to be you know a huge undertaking for the people that live long enough or that survive the fall of empire but i believe it's going to happen and i believe that the survival of indigenous people is the only thing that i can truly believe in and I don't know, I feel like the movies really, they demonstrate that. Like, there's hope, I think, in the planet of the apes, the version, <clears throat> a decolonized world. But I think if anything, that feels very real. Um, that is obviously fiction in the movie, but feels very real, is that even even if we achieve liberation, like that militarism and the, just like how the character of May represents this, how that deep seated desire to own everything and to have, to possess everything, like that's an internal, that's an internalized logic that is then manifest on the world and, and, and the ordering of, the social and the hierarchical ordering of whole populations of people and species across the planet that I don't know how to get rid of that. And that's still like very dangerous um, 
Because like I said, I think you, you're going to have to pry it out of the cold, dead fingers of the settlers, you know, because that's literally, that's who they are. That's what, yeah, that's why they wake up in the morning. <laughs> it's like well, it's, just possession. It's interesting that, that like in the end of war, Woody Harrelson kills himself rather than devolve. And like, that's his choice to, to destroy himself rather than devolve. But with May, she'll do anything to recreate this world that she's never known because, you know, generations have, so many generations have gone by, but this idea of human superiority or read, you know, as, as American superiority over everything else is the only thing that matters. Not necessarily survival, not necessarily, you know, kinship or friendship or, or having a home, a place to call home, a family. What she wants more than anything else is the rise of America, American empire. She wants to make America great again. <laughs> she does. <laughs> and Noah, because, and it's interesting, even though I know it's not spelled the same, Noah is like trying to lead his people to freedom and he's not on an ark and he doesn't have two of each creature but they they do it's interesting how they they intersperse roman and biblical names i mean the caucasity it's the whitest <laughs> shit in the world <laughs> those, those are the only reference <laughs> uh everything it's in everything and everything that we have to watch um, uh -huh. in, in American pop culture is that shit. I know, uh, and I, I, I was, I was just thinking, like the only thing really the Romans got right is when they fed the Christians to lions. But I don't know. That's still, I feel bad for the lions, so I can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, damn. So even. Even with a pandemic, a global pandemic, it was some eco-fascism on your side, <laughs> like just nature wiping out um, the human race, or in this case, wiping out U.S. imperialism, U.S. empire, or just the U.S. Uh, even then, it's still a struggle. The struggle to stop imperialism and to stop um, May you know, is still taking place. And what does generations later mean? Do you think it's like a like 150, 200 years later, maybe? When yeah, I would say that's about place? right. Yeah. I'll say like 200-ish years after Caesar dies. And so that you're like 200 years into this like decolonized world. And you still got to struggle against those, those, those settler imperialists, <laughs> even though there's like two of them left on the planet. It's like, uh, I guess the struggle is real. Like here we are, you know, just like the apes, like we'd still be trying to figure our own shit out, trying to figure out the, the new world that we want to build, you know, because we yeah. understand that there's an alternative and we're experimenting with all of the alternatives and the ways where we can just like, coexist with each other what caesar he also said ape together strong right yeah how we can live in community strong. Ape together strong let's ape together strong um this is something that also gets said in the red nation a lot too. <laughs> kobo was right and ape together strong <laughs> it's like indigenous communism but but seriously um so even then like all those years later you'd still have to be trying to ensure against the proximuses, you know, from trying to replicate US imperialism. Um, but like the vestiges of that stuff, it, 
it dies hard. <laughs> it does not die easy, I guess is what Proximus, I'm saying. And that's Proximus is Dickie Wilson. That's who, who, mm. who uh, Proximus is. Dickie mm. Wilson, for those who don't know, was the um, chairman of the, the, uh, um, what was it? What was his exact title? Oglala oh, Lakota? Or no, yeah. the no, 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 no. What was the name of it? Let me look it up. He was chairman of yeah of of a huge portion of of uh, the Lakota Nation in, in the sixty in the sixties, right when Planet of the Apes the first one came out, and and he was a horrible. Um, fascist um anti-traditionalist and um anti-aim yeah anti-aim um his goon squad guardians of the oglala nation the goon squad um would drive all over the the res and and shoot their own people So it just said he was the elected chairman of the old Glala Lakota of the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. I feel like. Yeah. Uh, is that true? Anyway. Yeah, no. Yeah, that's right. Ridiculous. And so even 200 years into the future, let's say we actually, let's say the United States falls and we get land back. Let's just talk about indigenous nations here. Um, we get to have true self-determination and autonomy. Like we still be struggling with that shit, you know, yeah. hundreds of years from now because of men. <laughs> I'm telling you, all these movies, that was what, what, you know, they, there was no, no women. They were all men. It's just a, it's like patriarchy on steroids and um, yeah. Woody Harrelson from Woody Harrelson to Proximus. Ye. Ugh. Yep. Well, that's not like super encouraging. <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice, even with the with like a total pandemic apocalypse, even if like people, which I don't, people who like really wish for eco fascism to take out like all the bad people in the world, even with that on your side, you still can't shake, you know, the the how deeply ingrained that kind of like settler imperial masculinity is um, in people. That's, that's a lesson. That's it a, is a lesson, a but lesson. we also have to re re remember that men did all of these films. So I'm sure I did like these films, but I'm sure if a woman director, a woman writer had done them, they would have been very different. Mm. Word. Because yeah. I, I think a post-apocalyptic world where women were equal partners to recreating a social structure, the world would look very different. And I'm actually not convinced that apes don't have as we know them now, don't have a more egalitarian um, type of social structure. <laughs> yeah, there's actually <clears throat> no commentary on gender. That's like a major flaw, I think, of these movies. There's no, you know, there's no awareness, I think, about gender in the movies. Yeah. Like, no, not, I mean, we've not said a this bit. multiple times. Not a bit. We've said this multiple times, um, you know, like, Contemporary indigenous movements are led by women, like yeah. almost entirely. And, you know, I've made this argument before that like the emphasis on uh, relationality and relationality and equality, but also relationality across different nations and species and not just a human centric relationality is very much comes out of like the indigenous feminist um the rise of indigenous feminism, I think, in the way that social movements have kind of like cohered and expressed themselves over the last decade or two. So that certainly provides an alternative forward, you know, that ugh, like masculinity, 
heteropatriarchy does not hetero heteropatriarchy like there's no future in it it's just violence it's really yeah. that's planet of the apes just feels real heteropatriarchal even the apes in a lot of ways yeah even the apes but but even when they throw in you know uh well may like she's not developed to the point where you you don't understand her motivations other than as a puppet of this pro military pro imperial um part of of you know survivors this group of survivors so she's she, she has no personality there's no character development for her um caesar is probably caesar and maurice i love maurice um but caesar oh, and my favorite character is maurice yeah and i even like bad ape um because Me in too. the end he really he really he he's brave and for someone who didn't want to go on the journey he ends up being very brave and saving the baby apes which is a good thing um but i i i mean even the apes have character development and, you know, you get a little bit of it with Woody Harrelson's character, you know, as horrible as he might be, you see how he's developed. He killed his son because his son was, you know, was infected. But there's no development in the female characters at all. And this is, yeah, this is just like a patri a heteropatriarchal wet dream is this whole, these whole set of movies. And, um, yeah. Even the, you know, the, the use of the Roman Empire, the names of the movies, Rise of the Planet of the Apes, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, War of the Planet of the Apes, Kingdom. I mean, it's there's all like male macho, you know, circle jerk terms. Yeah, it's real phallic. <laughs> Dumb. Well, shit. Well, whatever the next, if there is going to be another Planet of the Apes, it's going to be five to six years before it comes out because that seems to be the the general tempo. But that should be a feminist movie. I'm just letting everyone know now. I, want I agree. I want, I want something different. And the the humans, quote unquote, who are left can't just be white people. Come on, <laughs> come on. With dreads, like really, really. Uh, mm hmm. Well, I feel like we killed it. I I covered all the things that I wanted to talk about, and yep, and more. Like, I think we got and more, and more per usual. Like we really really pulled out every single thread we could. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, uh, cool. Thanks for listening, everyone. Um, we'll be back um, again. I'm not sure when. I think this has been three weeks. This has been a month since we last recorded but i don't know yeah. i think we can keep up this tempo i think we can and and uh um yeah more more to come i i may have another movie to critique an older one but one that i would like to do um last of the mohicans oh yeah i'll see if i can get someone interested in doing that Oh God, I, I'm so embarrassed. I actually, when I was, because I came out in like 1992, yeah. around the same time Dances with Wolves did. Yep. I was like 10 or I was young, but I really liked last week when came out like an asshole. And I'm, I'm going to admit that right here. <laughs> but no, since I then, mean, I know better. The, the, um, the scene, the cinematography is beautiful. I mean, all that um, eastern woodlands, um, the you know, the upper east east coast of of uh, the so called United States and Canada. I mean, it's it, it's beautiful. The the water, the mountains, the rivers. It was the water the that was very captivating for me. Yeah. As an Navajo person. Oh I, yeah, I mean that's that's exactly why I loved it too. I you just watching them in canoes and you're just going, oh my god, look at all that water. Um, as Pueblo people and Navajo people, <laughs> some of those. we don't get that. <laughs> that's like, oh, this is heaven. Who cares what they're doing? This is still heaven. Um, <laughs> exactly. But, 
And I and I have to admit, I also loved the music. And that's a weird thing, but I liked Me the music. Me too. It was the music. It's so emotional and like, yeah. uh, just like really pulls at your heartstrings. And I mean, yeah. listen, I was a preteen and so I was very shallow, but I thought all of the men in the movie were also extremely attractive. And so yeah. I had no politics at that age. I'm sorry. I have them now. It'll be interesting to watch it now. I have not watched that movie in... 20 25 years or something like yeah. that it'll be interesting i'm to watch down it now. for it i'm down and cena our beloved producer wants us to do it too and he might join in but it's um yeah it would be interesting to take another look at it um particularly since many of the native actors um have gone on to great great things and also have just gone on um walked on but um, just looking at that as sort of that era of of filmmaking about Native people would be interesting. Wait, is Russell Means the dad in that movie? Yeah. What the? <laughs> that just yeah. came back to me. Holy shit! <laughs> yep. Okay. Okay. We got so we got we got some things to talk about. <laughs> yep. Wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And of right, course, let's... beloved Magua. Oh, it's West Studi. Yeah. Who we all love, um, the OG. Um, and he's so good in that film. So yeah. Damn. I feel like I feel like West Studi was typecast for like 30 years as like the bad Indian. Because yeah. you know, he has like a very What's the word? Like his face, he's just like he's he looks stern, even though he's not stern. He's got that Stone like a, what do they call? It? Like he got that he's that stoic Indian face that Hollywood really yeah. loves. Yep, yeah. and he never had any lines. You know, you didn't know that he could carry on a conversation until like the twenty first century. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck man, Hollywood is so racist. <laughs> <laughs> well and on that vein like stay tuned because when once we take apart the way they talk in last of the mohicans oh my god that is so How? bad the dialogue no, okay <laughs> all right everyone that's what you got to all look right. forward to thanks for listening <laughs> oh one other thing did you hear that reservation dogs got a bunch of emmy nominations this year yep finally two thumbs up i hope they win something I sure, I sure hope so too. I mean, I really do. Time. Not that I care what anyone else thinks about it, but I, I feel like for the people who poured their heart and soul into that, they deserve it. Green. All right. Like, but for real now we can end this episode. <laughs> okay. get those things out. Talk to you all next time. Maybe it'll be about less of the Mohicans. I'm looking forward to that one. Bye.